Good afternoon all. Welcome to the fourth edition of the annual department conference conducted by the Humanities and Social Sciences Department, IIT Madras. This time our theme is migration. And I invite our respected head of department, Professor Malti Dorisami, to deliver the welcome address. Yeah. Good afternoon. And on the occasion of this annual conference hosted by the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Ravi Vasudevan from the Center for Study of Developing Societies, New Delhi, who has joined us today to deliver his inaugural address. We are honored by your presence, sir, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation to deliver this special talk on this occasion. I also take this opportunity to welcome our dignitaries present here. Um, we have with us Dr. Radha Hegde, who is an associate professor in Department of Media and Culture and Communication at New York University, and Professor Ira Baskar. Cinema Studies at School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Thank you also, both of you, for accepting our invitation. And thank you for joining us today. And we will also have other prominent uh, speakers joining us over the next couple of days. Professor Aparna Raiparal uh, of Sociology from the University of Pittsburgh, currently with uh, Department of Sociology, University of Hyderabad. Ravi Sribatsava from the Delhi School from Jawaharlal Nehru University and Priya Kumar um, who is also with uh, I think the University of Delhi. So they will be joining us and so let me say I would also like to convey our uh, sense of gratitude to them for accepting the invitation to be keynote speakers and I welcome them ahead of their arrival even when they are not here. And uh, I also take, um, would like to invite my own department's colleagues who are here, student participants from all over the country, and others from the department. Thank you all for coming and being here with us today. I'd like to use this uh, privilege of my standing in front of you to say a few words about the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Madras and also about the conference. Now, this is one of the oldest department in IIT Madras, a multidisciplinary department, 35 faculty members, so it's a big department. We have two more who will be joining us soon. So sizable in number and we have all, all of them are experts in diverse fields. So we have people representing anthropology and culture studies, development studies, economics, English, demography and gender studies, German history, international relations philosophy, political science, social, urban studies. So this is the kind of disciplinary representations that we have at, in our department at this point in time. So a very big department. Now we, have, we offer PhD program and currently there are about 50 students on roles, including a few part-time external candidates as well. And we also, since 2006, we start, in 2006 we started our five-year integrated master's program and currently this is being offered in two streams, English and Development Studies. So uh, uh, we have like about 200 plus students over the five years at any point. In time. So that's about the size of the department and the programs that we offer. And beginning 2012, this department has uh, have been hosting this annual conference which we call the Academic Conference, uh, a largely a student organized event. And this is the fourth edition of this conference and it is centered around the theme of migration. Now I should say that there was a huge response to our call for papers and I would like to thank all those who really submitted. So close to about 130 paper abstracts were received and uh, after screening 30 papers were shortlisted for presentation, oral and uh, poster presentation. So we have eight papers each in development studies in English for oral presentation, five in economics, and another nine for poster presentation, which is scheduled for tomorrow. Now, the, um, I, would, uh, I, I think I should mention at this point my word of appreciation for this organizing team, the students, and they were also helped by able faculty members, faculty advisors, so together 
they were able to uh, come up with the, 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 the theme, the concept notes, identify speakers, and then shortlist papers, so a whole lot of work, and they have done it so well, and I should convey my uh, sense of appreciation for all the work that this conference team has done. Thank you very much, all of you. Now, this conference will now be witness to four keynote speakers. And I would say for this, and over the period since 2012 when we started this, we have evolved, we have grown, in the sense that the participations, participation from students, including research scholars here, that has grown, and there is also greater involvement of faculty members too. So in, in that sense, this has moved from the way we started to becoming a more rigorous a professional kind of a conference. So that is the way, and this time around, there are certain things that we have added. So there are add-ons are, for the first time, we had a pre-conference lecture, and this was by the award-winning photojournalist and report MP Saina. So he, made, he gave a pre-conference lecture. And we also have now, as I said, uh, involvement from PhD scholars in a big way, and to accommodate more papers, because we had many, many responses coming in, we thought it's a good idea to also have poster presentations. So if all papers could not be accommodated, the selected ones for oral presentation, we thought we would uh, make some a way for that. So that poster presentation has been introduced from this year on. And starting this year, there will be a video recording of all the sessions. So uh, this will provide a record of this Department of HSS Academic Conference on migration this year and then other uh, kind of uh, things that is due to come in the years ahead. So um, the conference will begin with a special inaugural address, as I said, by Dr. Ravi Vasudevan, and this will be followed by an interactive session on diasporic royalties and loyalties and national anxieties with Dr. Radha Hegde, and that will be from 4 to 6 p.m and a movie screening of the Turkish-German drama Edge of Heaven, followed by a panel discussion chaired by Dr. Era Baskar. So I look forward to a very productive conference, and I'm sure that you also, you will have a wonderful learning experience, all the student participants here. A warm welcome again to all of you, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, ma'am. Next, I'd like to invite our Department Secretary, Ashwin Vijayan, a fifth-year student of the MA program, to introduce our speaker for the day. Good afternoon to all. Uh, our inaugural speaker, Professor Ravi Vazivan, is a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, CSDS New Delhi, in the area of film and media history. He is also a co-initiator of Sarai, the Center's urban and media research program. He has taught film studies at universities in India and the USA, and held fellowships at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, the School of Oriental and African Studies, and Princeton. His work on cinema explores issues in film, social history, politics, and contemporary media transformation. He is currently a visiting faculty at Jadavpur University, Kolkata, and Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. Professor Vasudevan has curated film exhibitions, lecture series, and conferences. Recently, he coordinated the international conference hosted by CSDS in January 2014. The event was titled The Many Lives of Indian Cinema, 1913-2013 and Beyond. His publications include Making Meaning in Indian Cinema, which he edited and was published in 2000, and The Melodramatic Public, Film, Form, Film, Form and Spectatorship in Indian Cinema, published in 2010. In his works, he explores the political and ideological implications of popular cinema through formal and narrative analysis, archival resources and oral testimony. Professor Vasudevan is the editorial advisor to Screen and the founding editor of Bioscope, a journal of South Asian screen studies. It's my pleasure to introduce such an eminent scholar who is here to give us an overview of the theme for the fourth edition of our department conference. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Ravi Vasudevan, CSDS, to deliver his address on cinema and circulation and to formally pronounced the annual academic conference of the Department of Humanities 2015 inaugurated. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, really uh, honored and uh, very uh, uh, 
in fact, kind of uh, pleasurably immersed in an environment uh, which is entirely different from where, from where I come from in New Delhi, uh, because I have never seen such a verdant space for such a long time. And there's no doubt that uh, technology uh, seems to be particularly blessed to be housed within such kinds of environment. Huh? And I hope that has, is a marker of something, of some future, although we worry that it is not. Uh, in any case, uh, Professor Malti and other members of the Faculty of uh, Humanities and uh, Development Studies, thank you very much for inviting me here, and especially the student team who have been very kind of uh, active and very systematic in organizing this visit. Uh, and at the outset, as you will make out uh, from the title of this talk, it doesn't directly address uh, the, the main thematic. And when my friend Solly Benjamin invited me to talk about migration, I said, I really do not have anything to say, Solly, about my migration. Nevertheless, I can actually uh, go sideways, sideways uh, step into another kind of uh, conceptual framework, uh, which may or may not uh, help us think about migration, which uh, suggests an idea that if migration often is construed to mean something which is going from one, uh, a person going from one point to another point to settle him or herself in another location, circulation uh, is maybe a more complex kind of description of the ways in which we never actually find fully leave places and we have ties to them and we actually go back to them. Uh, so, and we do not, we are not uh, left unchanged by the process. Uh, for this talk, and because it's about cinema, it's, uh, the issue is for me not only about the movements of peoples, but it's also about the movement of objects and technologies. Uh, the cinema itself becoming a, a vehicle, if you want. It is, it is an object, it is a technology, it's a body of equipment which is taken from place to place. Uh, it is also a vehicle of imaginary movement. That is, when we go to the cinema, we are actually transported. Uh, we may be sitting stably in one location, but we are actually carried huh, from one space to, to, to another, and we circulate within the space created by the cinema for us. Uh, so there's an imaginary circulation which cinema as a form facilitates. And it does it perhaps with a sense of uh, uh, in, uh, visual and auditory engagement, uh, which other media do, do not. Uh, arguably, literature also transports us, and other uh, such narrative forms also transport us and enable our circulation and movement in this fashion. Uh, so that is kind of a frame, a frame to think about, about circulation of people's technologies, objects, and how they actually undergo transformation huh, in the process of doing this. Now, Soli made a, se a second uh, suggestion. He said, I should be able to talk in a way we should address both development studies students and English studies students. So now that's an extra challenge. <laughs> uh, as, as it happens, I will have to take you back as a historian uh, into a longer kind of uh, patterning of this question of circulation and how the cinema as a technology was deployed in developing this imaginary. Uh, so I'm afraid there's not going to be kind of entertainment cinema on display by and large in this presentation. It will be uh, what is now increasingly being called useful cinema. Uh, it's a cinema of the type which it can be boring for a spectator who is not invested in it. Uh, but it's to do with instruction, uh, in, in the introduction of information, for example, about new technologies, huh? about how you can improve uh, introducing new implements, for example, in agriculture, uh, how you, uh, what type of precautions you need to take in order to actually kind of build, build a healthy and sanitary environment. These are very much the, the things, the, the, the matrix of you know, uh, policies to transform uh, populations in line with certain modern protocols and ways of actually preserving and reproducing a population. Uh, and they may be about new tasks, new forms of employment, new techniques uh, which, which are made available. Uh, this is actually a sphere which becomes extremely important, if you want, in developmental discourse, very critically founded around the logics of development, which has a long history, going back into the, certainly with a self-consciousness, into the post-First World War era, huh? uh, where under colonial governance, when there was a definite uh, 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 attempt to ward off 
the agitational politics of nationalism, which had now found increasing kind of presence in the countryside, in the mobilization of peasant populations, starting especially from the non-cooperation movement, going on through civil disobedience, and so on. So there's this, the way in which this was to be framed was to actually kind of contend with this growing command that nationalist politics had over peasant populations by, by uh, publicizing and propagating the fact that developmental dis, uh, transformations which were making the lives of people better were taking, was taking place. So publicity is key here. Uh, communication and publicity of a developmental policy becomes a kind of key framework within which cinema and, and, and related and precursor uh, media technologies were deployed. This would include things like the slideshow, the magic lantern, uh, which is actually a fabulous uh, contraption using sound and light uh, and actually kind of uh, organ uh, pushed by petroleum fumes. It actually is quite an extraordinary immersive uh, space as well and was used considerably from the late 19th century onwards. But it's from the uh, post-First World War that there was a bid to actually build uh, a cinematic uh, 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 policy around developmental discourse. So this becomes a, a key kind of context, with, uh, which I'd like to talk about, say, about 20 years of this period. I will reconnect with the sense of the contemporary towards the end of this discussion. Uh, one of the things which actually motivated me recently to revisit some of this was the fact that uh, the way these, um, the cinema, in this form, as an instructional medium, was taken to peasant populations, which were its targets, was through various mobile transportation uh, vehicles, for example, mobile vans, lorries, and also the railways. The railways was an extraordinarily important vehicle for the actual circulation of, cinema, of this kind of cinematic material to populations all around the country's type. Starting with the Northern Indian Railway, the Greater Indian Peninsula Railway, which is up there. Uh, and uh, uh, the other thing was mobile vans which were used um, which would house a number of different media forms. The, apart from cinema, which could be a 35 millimeter uh, projector, it could be an, a, a small scale uh, home movie projector, a 9.5 millimeter, 16 millimeter, which might be loaned from someone. It could be a radio transmitter huh? uh, and a slideshow. These were very uh, commonplace uh, technologies which were used to actually kind of move from place to place, point to point, to, uh, to uh, instruct peasant populations primarily in, this, uh, in the new ways, which could actually uh, be uh, new techniques which could improve life. Um, the railways uh, came in very strongly around 1926-27 when they uh, developed a, a series of cinema cars. Now the cinema car uh, is a kind of interesting... Uh, Phenomena. It is actually just a storage unit. It itself will not show cinema. It was the thing in which projectors, in which the film material would be housed, and in which the projectionist would travel, and it would be shown uh, out of doors, live, and they would normally track the kind of ritual and festival calendar in order to ensure that peasant populations who are already congregating for the, the normal pattern of ritual life or, ca or festival life would be available, if you want, for this cinematic uh, communication. Um, this was just kind of some background about the ways in which uh, this kind of enterprise was associated with what were called uh, loyalty associations, primarily organized by uh, landlords against peasant agitation and therefore in alliance with the government to say that there are these developmental activities taking place uh, to, to win peasant, the peasants away. There were various categories which were used. Visual education uh, was crucial. But public health, agriculture, industry, rural reconstruction, and cooperative society departments would be having films made. And would actually, the railway department itself, through its publicity uh, unit, would be making films and circulating films. Th that became one of the key kind of focal points. As part of this, this is not just located in one site. It is traversing the colonial space. We have a number of different kind of initiatives which are taking place in Africa, 
in the West Indies, in Southeast Asia, under the British Imperium, where there's a bid to actually engage peasant populations. Uh, and the crucial one, uh, a crucial starting point is something called the Colonial Film Unit, which actually orig uh, emerges in 1940, but which was in, uh, it was, its precursor was a health officer's amateur film work. You know, not something which was done formally, officially, but it was used to actually kind of develop an anti-plague awareness in the city of Lagos in 1929. Now, one very important thing here is that along with this mode of address, there's a certain understanding of the audience. Uh, the technology can address an audience with a view to actually uh, inculcating a developmental engagement around technology specifically and health, but you would need to be aware of how this audience was cognitively composed. What was the cognitive, the mindset, what is their capacity to understand what is actually being shown to them on the screen? And this, this almost became like a kind of formula, uh, a formula which traverses space, uh, a particular fixity to the way in which the peasant, say, uh, consumer of the cinema should be engaged. One, you must not cut. You must not have flashbacks. You should not dissolve. Maintain continuity. The film should be taken slowly. Huh? The, the, it should be in continuous time. There should be no jumps, such that there should be perceptual kind of confusion on the part of the, of the, of the, peasant, the ideal peasant spectator. In point of fact, a number of anthropological and other investigations in spaces like Kenya and uh, Nigeria were undertaken, which actually uh, uh, disestablished this argument. It showed this were true, that there was a certain mobility to the peasant public, and they could actually kind of pick up after a certain time, the various codes, if you want, through which cinematic storytelling or narration was taking place. And yet, it became fixed. Huh? It became this, the, the peasant is this figure with this cognitive constraint, and this is the ways in which film technique should actually be organized to, uh, to engage this peasant without confusing him or her. Uh, and this, it, remarkably, if that's a 1920 story, it's reproduced in a journal, say, of the Indian uh, documentary movement in 19, as late as 1953 and approvingly. So there's a certain fixity in which the way this peasant figure is actually kind of is understood, uh, constructed in this colonial discourse, but moving on into the post-colonial register. Uh, a second attribute would uh, uh, define peasant understanding of cinema. They were not happy to see uh, events, uh, environments, landscapes, uh, uh, agricultural practices, even the types of costumes, ev uh, everyday clothes, which were unfamiliar to them. This is a construct. I'm not saying this is necessarily true exactly. This is a construct. Uh, and uh, in point of fact, they would say that uh, you should not show, and this is the terms of the discourse, it is not my discourse, that a madrasi will not understand a Punjabi, huh? And not in terms of language, but in terms of the look of anything from the implement to the actual agrarian practice and to the latrine. These were very important kinds of things. Each of these things looks different. And we, we can tell you repeatedly that there's this fixity about the figure. What you have then is, is, is a very interesting way, uh, as in subjects, if you want, are being settled and fixed in terms of the logic of what, how you could address transformation. Within these parameters, you can address transformation. But uh, the interesting thing about this is that you also combine uh, this address to the peasant uh, with another set of protocols. Out of, say, 50-odd uh, films made in the uh, first year of the production by the railways, uh, something like, I won't go into some of this detail. This is an inter the Cinematograph Committee report of 27, which actually builds and describes some of the issues which I have. Uh, discuss the particular framings uh, uh, which were undertaken. But settling and mobilizing. If you want, the peasant is a fixed subject. Huh? Wants only local knowledge, wants to uh, recognize only certain patterns which are familiar to him or herself, and would work towards the transformative logic only when addressed in those terms. Huh? Now, this is actually part of a longer history if one looks at the history of uh, migration, mobilization, uh, labor recruitment and activation from the 19th century. 
arguably the first phase of colonial rule was very much about pacification. How do you actually settle peasant populations? Make them peasants, that is that they're settled on a land rather than nomadic, rather than tribal, rather than kind of peasant brigands who would be available for warfare. And how do you make them productive and taxable? This is the first, if you want, logic of the colonial form from the, up to the mid-19th century. But the second logic is to mobilize. Because if you, the latter part of colonialism, uh, plantations had to be serviced, mining, uh, uh, mines had to be serviced. You had to actually mobilize uh, people across, uh, you know, into different territories of empire, uh, say into East Africa or Southeast Asia. You would have to mobilize them for military warfare as, as soldiers, uh, in the Navy, as sailors. So there's actually, this, if you want, there are two uh, components to this. There's the bid to settle, to, to kind of hold them in place, to make them taxable, non-violent, meaning pacify them, disarm them. But you need to actually mobilize these people as well. I'll just step back for a minute, just as a kind of side note. Because if often we think about media technology, and I was just discussing this with Solly, we think, to think of media technology very much in terms of the media technologies from photography and audio forms through to cinema, telegraphy, etc. But when you, one crucial component which we often forget to think about in terms of media technology is paper, huh? is the document. Huh? And when we think about circulation, movement, and migration, one of the uh, issues which we need to attend to, of course, is the longer history of documentation which facilitates or prevents movement. Uh, it is the, the longer history of the passport, for example, which facilitates movement. There are various orders of actual uh, things which happened before the passport, which could uh, enable the movement, say, of laboring populations into new territories. So a labor contract which is put together at a port, maybe an adequate way in which you can actually facilitate the movement of labor into, say, a Southeast Asian, a Malaysian plantation through the labor contractor. And that becomes a longer-term paradigm or framework within which one needs to think about mobility and circulation, that is the actual monitoring of these forms through, the, through paper technology uh, and, and through the passport. So settling and mobilizing, you know, have this kind of, this dual dynamic, and a dynamic which actually emerges very powerfully into the, into the register of mobilization in the late 19th century. It brings with it its own anxieties of governance, so that along with the technologies of the paper documentation and, uh, and file work of the passport, there will be bids to actually monitor the movement of these populations, not only through those controls, but through, for example, identification contracts, fingerprinting. Uh, uh, media technologies often come together. And uh, if you have a look at Christopher Pinney's uh, history of the coming of photography to India, you'll notice that uh, telegraphy and the fingerprint come together so that actual fingerprints can be telegraphed of lists of people who, are, uh, who have a, a, a prison record or are suspects to new locations to monitor their movement. Because there's considerable anxiety that, yes, you have to mobilize these populations, but at the same time, you have to monitor and control, uh, know where bad people are going, people who are likely to take advantage of these heightened circuits of mobilization and mo mobility. So there's this kind of layering one needs to think about when one's thinking through the history of, if you want, media technologies, of which paper, writing, and print are as much a component as the ones which we are talking about today. You know, the, the way in which a media technology comes to us, it has to come through some uh, mechanism. And, of course, today we can talk about file transfers. You know, we can talk about not uh, circulation but virality. You know, you can think about heightened ways in which material is moving. Now, even then there were notions of speed. It is not as if there's only one notion of speed huh, of, or of velocity or of movement. Huh? The railways was absolutely a culture shock, you know, when it emerges in the 19th century. It was a terrific, just as road transportation, cars, etc., were actually a culture shock. Uh, and they were things which we needed to actually uh, adjust to, to actually come to terms with and engage in sensory ways where your, your nervous system was not completely afflicted by these. But if, uh, in this case, what one needs to think about is that railways transport people with great speed 
in relative terms at those times uh, into new spaces, huh? facilitating this logic of circulation. But in the logic of developmental media technology, which I'm referring to now, you cannot separate the media technology from its modes of transportation. They are embedded one in the other. So when a mobile van arrives in a space, it becomes a certain arrangement. You know, it is, now this looks rather from the point of view of the 21st century, a rather dilapidated kind of form. It is something loaned by the talukdar, a talukdar of Avad, huh, as part of the anti-non-cooperation uh, drive to actually develop a developmental kind of uh, publicity for the government uh, in the UP at the height of Mahatma Gandhi's civil disobedience movement. Huh? Um, and you have this, uh, this group of people. Uh, one needs to think, uh, I, I'll keep on uh, referring to extra layers as I move on. We need to think not only about the infrastructures, now the term infrastructure is important, which are composed of transportation and media projection, huh? but there are also biographies entangled with these things. The people who facilitate this kind of movement. It could be the projectionist. It can be a film entrepreneur. Huh? These are kind of key figures. In this case, it would be also a driver. There could be a, another figure who becomes extremely important because meanings should not be loose. You must actually channel the nature of meaning. When I show you a film, often there, there are problems of communication from various angles. Intertitles, if, if one how many intertitles are you going to use uh, on one film? There are. You know, you'll have uh, interchangeable intertitles in different languages. Huh? But sometimes films are played silent because the audiences will not know the language in which the film has been made. Uh, so then, critical figure. If you say that the projectionist and the, you know, the driver uh, is, is an important figure, uh, the, the institutional infrastructure and uh, talukdar of Avad, that is a landlord, uh, is also part of the institutional infrastructure, a lecturer becomes absolutely key. Now, a lecturer will also possibly have the logic of the microphone. We're thinking of a multimedia form within which this kind of communication relay to peasant populations is, is, is taking place. Huh? Uh, the radio transmitter, of course, depending on whether there's actual connectivity in the area. Uh, so the lecturer becomes the figure who will try and hold meanings in place say what these images mean, huh? communicate perhaps uh, health policies. It could be the agricultural officer, a district public officer, publicity officer, a health officer. Huh? We don't know, you know, a lot of this when we're looking at the archive for this material, we're looking at it in terms of how uh, government and levels of government present the effects of this thing. We don't know that that is necessarily how audiences receive this. And I will suggest a way we can think about that. But if we um, move into the wider historiography of uh, developmental cinema in this colonial period, uh, the work of James Burns on uh, South, South Africa, specifically Zimbabwe, modern day Zimbabwe, uh, has shown that the, the interpreter or the translator for these works might often uh, not adequately communicate what was being said. He may actually kind of subvert what was being said. The audiences would take issue with how aspects, say, of village life or village custom were actually represented on screen. So you can imagine a rather complex space within which this developmental discourse is actually playing out. Not, not, in, you know, not with straightforward clarity and you know, uh, effects of that sort. So there's a complex thing there where we need to think about the apparatus as a complex layer between and infrastructures of transportation, media technology and projection, but also the deployment of human capital, if you want, huh? in order to make all of this work. And the interruptions, you know, the way this can be disrupted entirely and not fulfill uh, the, the uh, objectives of, 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 of policy. This is actually detailing of, you know, the various components which would go into a van like this. Along with it, there'll be physical exhibition, you know, new seeds, carpentry, um, uh, inevitably cattle or, or buffalo uh, displays. Um, but let me come to this key area which I would like to just reflect on for a while. This thing between transportation and media technology and projection, that relationship becomes actually something to think through. 
if you're uh, you know wanting to pursue uh, the the cultural logic uh, of the emergence of ra the uh, railway uh, no better or more stimulating book than wolfgang shivel bush's the railway journey uh, this is is it's a great read it's really about how exactly notions of time and space are completely transformed by the nature of the kind of speed through which uh, railway transportation carries people but it's also about other very interesting things if we think about circulation and the ways in which uh, travel alters the nature of human perception and and social engagement the railway compartment also becomes a very important space the meeting with strangers the striking up of casual uh, relationships or knowledges or information about all sorts of things you know it becomes a very interesting space as itself so that if you want circulation is not simply about moving around into different spaces but there is a space of circulation in circulation you know uh, inside these these modes of transportation buses uh, trains you know lorries all sorts of vehicles they are actually areas of uh, social sociality of circulation and sociality in a, in a novel fashion but i wanted to come back to this particular uh, question about um, the types of film one of the issues is the types of film i think it's quite remarkable and i haven't i'm tracking this uh, in comparative history where uh, whether any other uh, country actually had this type of a deployment of railway for film use you know people would circulate but this is actually a film unit a film unit which is making films for all departments agriculture cooperative societies uh, industry um uh was actually being done through the indian railways certainly from the 1920s and i'm not sure what the post independence in independence history is as yet i'm still tracking that but certainly there through the colonial period composition of the film program of the types of films they were making so you'll notice in one year 1928 out of 48 films 23 films in fact 33 films i would say 33 films have nothing to do with the ostensible objects of development so agriculture irrigation etc industrial health huh? even technical matters pertaining to railways we'll put it under the broad param, uh, fr framework rubric of development places of interest for tourists places of interest for indian pilgrims now these are two very important things they're almost half of the production now so they're already unsettling the idea of what this kind of cinema uh, developmental so called developmental cinema was meant to do to settle but to mobilize huh? to travel now in fact one of the arguments that the chief publicity officer of the railways of 1928 says makes is that uh, what we want to do is that peasants through the uh, in uh, the communication of new technologies and infrastructures will be actually surplus generating populations huh? that surplus will feed back into the into the uh, into the market into consumption and into travel so there is this particular doubling of address to settle to mobilize a mobilize means to make travel but to open new vistas through travel a more conventional framework one which you through which you would elicit a certain traditional public is the idea of the pilgrimage no a new pilgrimage sites but travel is much more open it's across the country it's opening new kind of vistas new spaces in which to go to so we have between the figure who is actually meant to be to to uh, improve his or her life is the figure who through improvement of his or her own life will generate surpluses which will actually make them consumers travelers and expand the terms of the economy and of the railways itself so this i think is quite suggested this movement this doubling and it is actually uh this is these are images of the which blueprints of the railway cinema car which are available in the government archives which the sarai media research group has collected they're basically storage units huh um but this thing they were consuming if i've said travel or pilgrimage complicates the actual kind of imaginary space which these uh, consumer these spectators were drawn into then there are other logics one is that of the bazaar train now there's another very important and i think useful book from the point of view of development and media technology is brian larkin's book called signal and noise huh? which is about media technologies and their histories in nigeria going from the colonial period into the contemporary period 
and mapping this extraordinary phenomenon of the Nigerian video film industry, which is a very powerful uh, dimension of the world film economy in some sense now. Uh, but Larkin points to suggest that a lot of these kind of instructional works for colonial populations had nothing to do with the market. They were to actually constitute the peasant uh, as a kind of consumer of modern technology and as a citizen, as a, as a citizen in process who would be alert to the logics of public health and sanitation that is a public good in some fashion. But if you look at something like the, the bazaar train in the Indian context, you are actually combining forms. In the bazaar train is housed a cinema car. In the bazaar train are housed shops. Now the shops will, can attend directly to the agrarian economy. Say so they may be retailing fertilizer. Huh? But there would be uh, uh, watch shops, uh, there would be other, um, uh, there would be uh, radios. Uh, the number of uh, different items now came into display uh, through the bazaar train, which is also housing a cinema car. So we actually have not something which is governed by a one-to-one -one relationship between state and the uh, peasant consumer subject, huh? which is related to a developmental discourse of improvement, but also drawing that subject into a consumption logic. The bazaar is an expanded market imaginary through the train. So commodity logics and, if you want, instructional logics, the logics of pedagogy about how to actually kind of improve your life and, and be a good uh, citizen or a good public are combined in this fashion. Through a kind of array of different elements of the population, including peasant publics, clearly middle class figures, huh? uh, down the way uh, uh, there's a watch shop, there's farm, where is pharmaceutical, there's a watch shop if you look down in the thing, watches were very important during this period. Time and uh, the railway as a kind of vehicle of time huh? and the railway uh, um, uh, calendar and the railway timetable were very important, but watches also were extremely important, certainly from the First World War. So you get this kind of vivid imaging of figures. Imagine the cinema car, the railway, the bazaar uh, shops, which were in, uh, on display, and a commodity kind of circuit, which ex exceeds or is side by side with a certain pedagogic logic, a logic of teaching people new things. There's an interesting thing from a 1942 thing. The ideal site for the arena is a clear piece of ground with the train forming a background. If you want, this is the vista. What, what does going to the cinema mean? Going to the cinema means going to the railway lines huh? and to the railway as a kind of frame within which you actually see the cinema. So what you have is a kind of condensation, one thing layered on into another. The projection takes place in the background not of a theatrical production, not even a kind of pandal, but against this background. It's as if time and space are being interestingly configured. The distance, the railway, if you call it, encodes distance. It has come from a great distance. You know? It brings things from a great distance, and it comes to this place where it will actually present not only a new circulation of commodities for you to actually uh, be part of, to be, uh, whose imaginary world you are invited to be part of, but it will also take you to places. It brings things through which will enable you to go places, transports you through film technology, and the logics of film editing, montage, takes you into these different areas. I think nothing more powerfully registers the complexity of this in the fact that nowhere ever, apart from the fact that you have this braiding of commodity networks and instructional or pedagogical kind of usages, you also have the fact that entertainment is never off the agenda. Entertainment is part and parcel of the design. Without exception, whenever a figure of district publicity, an uh, uh, agricultural officer, talks about the program which they have to put together in order to engage audiences, there has to be an entertainment component. Now, the most popular figure, and you uh, would not be surprised, is Charlie Chaplin. Uh, and invariably, there would be a Charlie Chaplin component to the cinema program. But you would actually have mainline major exhibitors like Madden, who is a very important figure of the 19, uh, up to the end of the 1920s, and who would be actually bringing fairly up-to-date films. Recently, two or three years, a huge hit called The Thief of Baghdad would be actually screened in this kind of program. Huh? So this, this is really a complex braiding. If we now rethink 
the developmental subject, the figure who is actually at the kind of intersection of all these things, transportation, media projection, a complex weave of commodities, but also fictional forms, huh? which are different ways, if you want. A fictional form is also about imagining different ways of being in the world, you know, outside the common ken of what you can be. It takes you into a different logic of being. So you have an interesting kind of uh, uh, complex of effects which are being generated through this braiding. Distances, the transportation through media technology into other kind of realms, uh, which becomes very suggestive. So uh, I just wanted to uh, come back to this uh, figure of what I'd like, I'm just kind of uh, hypothesizing this, uh, about this now. You know, Larkin has this very interesting essay called uh, about infrastructure and anthropologies of infrastructure, where he says one of the things that infrastructure does, you know, infrastructure is meant to support other things, you know, it's a network, it's their roads which facilitate movement, there are electrical circuits uh, which uh, enable all sorts of things from lighting to kind of uh, what we're doing now. Um, now, but infrastructures also address you. They are speaking to you. You know, it's as if architecturally I put a dam or a kind of um, flyover in place. It actually creates a different vista, uh, you know, a landscape, a, a, a view uh, for you to look at. But not only to look at, to be addressed by that this is what the world is and these are the things which are transforming your universe. Huh? If you want, the railway is doing this. Railway brings these things, it frames it. It frames and projects things in front of you. Huh? Um, but those infrastructures are actually facilitated by all sorts of figures. As we said, and uh, just to actually kind of use a provisional category, they have biographies. Now, infrastructures, which can mean that the actual infrastructure, it can be cinema, it can be a particular camera, it can be a sound system, it could be actually an engineering technology which puts a dam or a kind of canal in place. They have histories, they mutate, they change, they elaborate, and with them, and there would be nothing without the human entities who actually facilitate all these things, which have to do with skills, disciplines, engineering capacities, uh, learning how to use a camera, etc., etc. And they can be about entertainment impresarios, the people who make entertainment available to you. There are a number of these figures. I won't go into detail about them, but a figure like J.F. Madden, who kind of was the cinema czar of the subcontinent in, in the 1920s. He owned a huge number of cinemas throughout the thing, but he also kind of used all sorts of technologies. He, in fact, was part of colonial policy to facilitate uh, traveling cinemas for war propaganda. There are a series of things. If you look carefully, and there's this, for those who really uh, want to look more deeply and intricately into this kind of area, there's an extraordinary document called the Indian Cinematograph Committee Evidences which looks at a host of people involved in the cinema trade. And you find people who are self-taught cameramen, who were aeronautical, was an aeronautical engineer, he's involved in actually film distribution, he does aerial photography. You know, the camera and this figure are moving into all sorts of spaces, if you want. And there are a couple of others whom I will not go into in detail. But I wanted to suggest, and this is where I'll come back, there's this, important, there's this extraordinary family who from 1909 on until today have been involved in telegraphy, uh, in radio, in loudspeaker and microphone equipment, uh, in uh, airport lighting, in uh, the short film, the camera equipment trade, uh, in short film making, called the Motwanes, whose client is Vikramaditya Motwane of Bhutan. Huh? Uh, you have what I'd call as an infrastructural biography. It's actually a proliferation of things which the technology, you know, and the people who, and the institutional forms and the biographies which actually kind of carry that, uh, make that possible. I'm going to come to a conclusion now. <laughs> it struck me when this image first came up, I, a, a sense of bewilderment, you know, how in this day and age, of satellite broadcasting, where anything can be beamed anywhere. Huh? Why should you actually have to have something which has to be physically presented? Mark, this is physically. The figure, the hologram, is not physical. But its actual pro projection and being made available is actually physical. There's a, sta there's a lorry, there's a stage. Uh, part of the technology is a screen. 
and the screen is of such an order, it's light fiber gossamer which you cannot see clearly. It is the screen on which this figure seems to be a three-dimensional entity who has to be projected. Huh? So there has to be a projector, there is a screen, there is a mobile transportational technology which brings this figure into view. Huh? And I think it's quite remarkable that, you know, what is this about? There is an infrastructural biography here which has to do with uh, the particular uh, technology which has been perfected by this company called Musion. And I'm sure most of you are aware about how it has actually been used to actually kind of mobilize figures who have passed away into rock performances and things like that. Huh? Tupac Shakur is the figure best known for this. Huh? You can track it on, the, on Google. Now, Mani Shankar, who is a bo Bollywood uh, film director who made this high, uh, Hollywood sta Bollywood standards high-tech film about the attacks on parliament called December 16th, huh? he was the one who actually was involved in actually making this technology available. And it's not only Narendra Modi, but others have been using it as well. Um, and a young chap called Senthil Kumar went and actually learned how to use it. Now, Manishankar has asked, so why? What is this about? I mean, why do you think you need to use this? So he says, the hologram does not need Z-class security. Huh? Uh, it, you can actually be very close to the hologram, and it is so lifelike that you can look into his eyes. You can look into his eyes. Yesterday when I was coming down by, by flight, I noticed someone who's uh, an, a young engineer, uh, uh, software engineer who's done a selfie, a Narendra Modi selfie, where you can actually kind of picture yourself with Modi as an app. Uh, so that you are, I mean, this goes back long. Huh? We're talking about Nathdwara, where you are in plot yourself in a kind of, you know, built kind of pictorial space and, as part of it. But this is a new kind of imagination. It is about combination of distances huh? and the fact of making something present. How do you make something present? There's still a logic of making that <coughs> present in a way. It is, a, as far as my reading is concerned, it is a complete fiction that this is simultaneous address to across the country. It is a recorded thing which is actually then projected, but it is projected. So there's this remarkable way in which one can think about circulation, but also combination, the way in which subjects are combined with image spaces huh, in order to actually engender a notion of transformation of some order or, or a new horizon of perception. And whatever the politics of it is a separate case. It's just interesting that there's, there's this long continuity and this continuous reinscription of media technology through vectors of distance and transportation huh, into localities, into specific spaces to target specific audiences, to gain them that sense of material presence in some way, but entirely imaginary at one level. I just, I'll conclude there. I think, I hope there's enough on the plate for you to think about. Thank you. body is a kind of uh, object of inscription, just as you say that paper may be written on, but you can write on the body. Huh? And that's part of the longer history also of, I mean, it's uh, from, uh, of actually kind of marking figures or branding figures. There's a longer history to do with incarceration, uh, which is there in the 19th century, which the colonial, I mean, the lo one logic is that colonial government tried to supplant this by this new, uh, a new sense of incarceration, and so that it's not, you're not marked on the body, but in the mind and through discipline, you know, the Foucauldian kind of logic of discipline and punish. Uh, but that certainly is one dimension you can refer to. The other thing I think is this new uh, research onto, uh, you know, sensory engagement, you know, how the body itself is, is continuous in some way with the actual kind of technological field. And this may be to do with, uh, uh, there's been this remarkable work on, uh, uh, this uh, uh, person who recently visited JNU, uh, Jonathan Stern, huh? is called the audible past. Uh, and there Stern has actually uh, looked at the history of, say, telephony, huh? and the ways in which, say, uh, there was a way of actually kind of uh, researching the field of uh, audibility. Uh, it's called psychoacoustics, which emerges in the uh, late 19th uh, century, uh, to see what level of, hear of hearing, what, what levels of sound, you could hear. 
and how you could do away with certain levels of sound in order to facilitate actual kind of telephone communication or greater levels and lines of telephone communication. So this thing about uh, investigating the body, huh, as much as investigating technology, they run tandem. Huh, they go together. Uh, they're not separate. The one thing affecting the other. Media technology affects us. No, the actual research is actually to say, what is the, is, are these various sensory capacities able to do? You know? I'm not familiar adequately of the range of things which must be part and parcel of, say, computer things. But obviously the whole ways in which the way our touch is now actually connecting us in an entirely different way to actual travel. So you can actually track, as we know, revenues are actually orchestrated through this, no? uh, mapping the kind of range of things we access. So the keypad and all that becomes, a, a touchpad becomes part, if you want, of a wider economy and technology in which the human body is actually uh, uh, linked, uh, sensorily linked no? in some key way. There's a lot on neurology now. Actually, the way in the, the, way the neurological system actually uh, relates to uh, sound, to sound and to sight. Actually, levels of perception. One of the concerns of, say, the colonial film uh, ideologues whom I was referring to, they said that you know these African audiences whom we have been looking at, they will say interesting things like, for example, if you have a vertical pan, a vertical pan, up say a building, they say the building is sinking, huh? Or suddenly they'll, they'll describe, they'll, they'll be asked to describe a particular scene. And they say, there was a chicken which scuttled off the screen on, in that shot, and which was never seen or noticed by the person who made the film, but it's there. Now, in fact, that's actually quite interesting. It has to do with, in fact, how you, you know, perception has to be organized and you have to be centered. So there's a question of technique, as we know, perspective becomes historically very important. But what's happening there is the two things going together. And the 19th century is really about also research into the human body and how to actually link technologies to or adapt technologies to this, the different registers of perception. In fact, he uses the term perceptual capital huh? and the ways in which you can, the perceptual techniques, huh? uh, which can become perceptual capital. Yeah? So it's the capacities but which can actually be used, say, by telephone companies. How, many, how much we can shave off that amount of sound, because you don't only need to listen to that amount of sound in order to, to actually communicate. It's the same thing with MP3. No? So Stern has done another book on the MP3 file and how exactly it condenses sound, compresses sound, but adequately in order for it to be heard, but you don't have to move so many registers of sound into it. In fact, that's, uh, there's, that's, I mean, often have thought about the art installation of the media. Art installation is an inter interesting kind of uh, form now. Because now it's actually kind of settling space. You know, it's spatial. Isn't it very profoundly spatial? You'll have the video component to it. But there's a way in which there's a settlement of the gaze. You know, you can actually stand in a space. Like, you know, for example, your horse-drawn carriage versus the, the railway. And here there's a new way in which almost as if you're arresting things, no? I'm not sure, I'm sure that it's a more complex, rent. you know what I'm talking about. So that you go into a spatial form. It is the art gallery, but the art gallery is now kind of housing all these different types of things. It could be objects, it can be film material, video, uh, f photographs, built things, huh? and you're actually given time to which, in which to, and to wait, to review, it's a loop, so you can go back to something. It's interesting that there's a, you know, sometimes the avant-garde may be wanting to slow things down. You know, it's like, for example, you often think that uh, avant-garde meaning people who are actually uh, the artists who are kind of capture a sense of a kind of the forward rush of technology and the sensoria, which it was very much an early 20th century thing. It can be that now in the contemporary, maybe there's a reverse thing. That you say, no, you know, speed has to be. I asked, uh, well, I remember one uh, 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 such artist, I said, so I showed him some of this stuff. So I said, he, I said what would you do with it? Because you're not going to research it. I have to do the boring stuff of making sense of these kind of rather tedious things. I would slow it. I would slow it so it actually breaks down and I can see kind of elements in the way in which this thing has been put together. So there's this way of, de you know, a particular deconstructive kind of logic where you are looking at it in that. Um, so there's something, this interplay may be going in interesting cycles there. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. There has been this very, uh, I mean, it's a long... Uh, History. I suppose we have felt it much more in the contemporary period when heightened kind of patterns of movement and globalization have appeared. 
sometimes, I mean, it's this, uh, the thing is that the place you, home is never the place you left. No, there's this other kind of logic. It need not be the place you left. You know, I actually, I mean, I just recently saw a film where uh, someone, I think a West Indian migrant, decides that she cannot handle London. Huh? And uh, this is to to told from the point of view of her daughter. Huh? And she said, I, I leave. I'm leaving. And she went back in, say, the 60s or seven, early 70s or something like that. And now she says, I'm missing you, my daughter, and I want to return. And uh, the daughter says, do not return because there is no point. This is not the place you inhabited. So the imagination you have of the place which, you know, you consider home is no longer available. Now, you can, cinematically, of course, that's, that's com complex. But, I mean, there is this thing, you know, there's a fetishization of home. You know, it's, home needs to be fixed. It has to be emotionally comforting, as, as securing you from the, the travails of, of the experience you are suffering. So it's interesting that this thing is not necessarily a revisiting of home, but of a certain image of home. Huh? It's, it's Yash Chopra's, uh, you know, his uh, Sarson feels and his, you know, there's a particular way in. So, I mean, that kind of home which, say, Dilwale Dulaniya Le Jayenge, those kinds, I'm sure there must be Tamil and Malayalam instance, instances of this as well, very strongly. Um, but yes, I think there's, there's there, but how do you actually, con how do you analyze that home, that relationality? I think relationality would be important here. One is that the usefulness is from the point of view of the state. Huh? Uh, what is useful? It is useful for me to actually transform this agrarian population. Huh? Um, the second level, which is not often addressed, I had mentioned this commodity networks within which is, this is taking place. But uh, arguably, a lot of this technology, say, something like fertilizer, huh? something like kind of road building surfaces. You will see oil companies like Burma Shell being absolutely kind of critical to how that thing is being marketed. Now, it may be coming through the state. It may not be a kind of uh, publicity or commercial kind of a plug by, uh, by a commercial en enterprise. So the uses are actually of a certain sort. Now, the position of the spectator in this huh, is what is up for, you know, it's indiscernible. I mean, it's, uh, uh, there have been attempts, for example, by historians of science and technology working with transformations in the countryside. Huh? There's a, a chap called, uh, he's written, uh, worked on Bengal. Uh, and his name is Pet Petri, I think. I think Ian Petri. But he's, he's tried to check whether, in fact, the types of agri agricultural improvements, say new seeds, were ag being taken up by uh, peas the peasant uh, communities. And he's saying often they were not. They actually uh, utilized their own intelligence about what would work and what would not. So there's definitely a kind of, you know, a filter through which these kind of things are actually being appropriated. My, my point here was that you can certainly, you should do that, and I think, uh, say, anyone working in developmental discourse, uh, publicity and this mode of actual information circulation would be, I think, important registers. One has to take that seriously. Huh? Um, so our government plans implemented, do these things work or not? That's certainly important. But the other side is to say, to complicate the position of the spectator. What range of experiences is he actually recipient of? Now, I will not then be able to tell you purposefully that this, I can say that this is what he's, he or she is making of it. Huh? I can say these are the networks. There are commodity networks, there are entertainment networks within which, which are not use, which may be not useful, you know. But the useful item, that is the technology, the equipment which is being relayed, is embedded within this. So what exactly is happening is, is an opening out, a sensory opening out, an opening out to new things, new kind of spaces huh? uh, with, within which this figure is being configured. Not by someone else, but by all these networks together. This is a problem in reception studies. You, know, you don't ever, you know, reception studies has to be, even in entertainment cinema, there's a challenge within reception studies, how to do it. This is probably more complicated, I'd argue. Okay? Okay? <laughs> Thank you. I just remove this. Huh? I just remove the. Thank you, sir. Um, as a token of our gratitude, I'd like to invite our Professor Solomon Benjamin to present our speaker, Dr. Ravi Vasudevan, with 
a memento. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The first one. I'm presenting him. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. We will uh, now come to an end of our inaugural session. I call upon Dilip to propose a word of thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my privilege to have been uh, asked to propose a vote of thanks on this momentous occasion. Uh, to begin with, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Ravi Vasudevan for being with us and inaugurating the conference by taking his time out amidst his busy schedule. He has given us great insights into cinema and circulation. I would then like to thank Professor uh, Radha Hegde and uh, Professor Ira Bhaskar for joining us today. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for our head of department, Professor Malati, who has always been very supportive to us and for, and for providing very valuable contributions in making this conference a reality. I would then like to extend my thanks to all the faculty and staff attending the conference. Uh, finally, I would like to extend our, extend our gratitude uh, to the participants and learned guests participating in the event. Thank you.